to orient you, we're starting at 6 o'clock. We're going around clockwise to show you the markings. And it is our perception that there was no movement of the hatch when we repressurized back to 14.7. Thank you, Tammy. Appreciate that, Tammy. The, uh, direction. Yeah, that gave us a very good idea of, uh, of what you had told us in words uh, a couple of days ago. So uh, we really appreciated that, and, th and that concludes our uh, our uh, requirements for uh, for downlink of uh, of the hatch. Thank you very much. That was excellent. You're welcome. Okay, Houston, uh, Columbia, uh, I did the first uh, series here on the tape, and uh, we're starting now with the B3 setting on the power tool. It was very easy holding onto the handrail of the hatch to manipulate the tool through the B3 and B4 settings. There was only a slight amount of torque applied when the fastener went all the way down to the hard stop. We copy. And you'll have to watch us run through the series. But uh, the basic finding at B5 was that the uh, body position was disturbed quite a bit by the B5 hard stop force. And B6 and B7, while attempted, really swung the body around to the point where the tool was hopping off the bolts or you could not hold your body position. And Houston, while we still have a few minutes of KU, I can uh, just say briefly that uh, we all found very similar results, that the B3 setting corresponding to five foot-pounds um, was certainly acceptable, as was B4. But when we get to B5 setting, the 15 foot-pounds, um, that's a fair amount of force to react uh, through your wrist. Uh, B6, again, um, we got low torque readings indicating that we let go of the trigger early. And if we have enough time in this KU downlink, you'll see when I get to that setting, um, my body will get spun around much like Tom's did. Um, one thing to think about when you're setting up uh, your test, is, as Tom mentioned, was that we will be on umbilicals. Uh, handrail position is very important. This handrail position is not ideal. A handrail on the floor would have been a little bit more comfortable when reacting to higher torques. And uh, we're wondering if we have enough clearance in the mid-deck uh, in a suit without our, our legs contacting the walls and, and biasing the data. If you're truly looking for us to hold the tool and react all that torque through the wrist and not use our body in any way as previously briefed uh, before we flew. We copy all. My data came out the same as uh, Amy's and Tom's, basically up through uh, 15 foot. 
book now went very well. Uh, beyond that, uh, in this particular non-suited environment, uh, it's not reasonable. I intuitively think that this is going to go a whole lot better when you're suited because uh, instead of having 160 pounds of body inertia, you have about 480 pounds to help uh, stabilize the body when the tool reaches its final torque. I also intuitively think that a gloved hand is going to hang onto the pistol grip a lot better than the bare hand does. And there's also a lot more strength and stability, at least stability, in the, uh, the wrist and arms of a suit. So uh, I intuitively think that this is going to go a lot better in a suited situation. We copy. Space Shuttle Columbia, astronauts Tammy Jernigan and Tom Jones are with us. The two of you, thanks for letting us be with you in the middle of your day. We can't start without talking about the fact you didn't get to go outside and conduct your spacewalks. Everybody on Earth is talking about it. What went through your mind, Tammy, when you tried to turn that uh, hatch handle and it didn't work? Well, I was certainly surprised that the handle would not rotate um, as I had trained for it to rotate. Um, certainly was uh, frustrated, and so we tried to rotate a little harder and actually end up working for a couple hours trying to get the hatch open. So we were certainly disappointed, but also thinking that um, there was a lot of time left in the flight, and we knew that the ground team and the crew would work hard together to perhaps think of a workaround. Yeah. Uh, Tom, you got into the act after that uh, in that very cramped airlock with, with Tammy. What did you think the problem was? Well, initially, I just thought we had a sticky hatch, and the fact that uh, Tammy's initial rotation wasn't able to free it up was just an indication that we'd have to put a little bit more elbow grease into it. She certainly tried, uh, and then asked me to give it a shot, and I wasn't able to budget either. And we were both putting, about, putting out about the, the maximum force we ever tried to put in to uh, uh, mechanical systems in, the, in our water tank training back in Houston. And so at that point, I started to think that uh, we had a jam of some sort that our strength wasn't going to be able to overcome. And so we, during those two hours in the airlock, while we juggled our bodies around and tried to find a more mechanical advantage, uh, I was also thinking about perhaps coming back the next day and trying this with uh, some more strategy. Um, what were the two of you trained to do? I guess let, let's start with Tom on this one. In case you were able to get the airlock open, but then uh, you couldn't get it to seal completely when you were finished with your spacewalk. Well, we had uh, physics working for us in that case. Uh, once we got back inside the airlock after an EVA, um, the airlock glides up against its seals uh, with a very easy motion, and turning the crank handle nearly engages some uh, mechanical dogs that hold the hatch mechanically tight. But if we could get it close enough where it would actually touch the seal, as soon as we let air in from inside the orbiter cabin, then that air pressure would slam that hatch shut up against the seals, and it would stay closed no matter how strongly we pulled on it. So we were pretty confident that uh, we wouldn't be um, in a bad situation. But there's always a potential in trying to uh, get our way out mechanically with some of the tools we have on board that we might damage or warp the hatch in such a way that those seals could be damaged. And I think that's the conservative approach that uh, the shuttle program has taken here. They didn't want to damage the hardware for uh, the objectives of this EVA, which could be rescheduled and flown on a later flight. Yeah, that, that's the question that a lot of people have now. What are the two of you going to do about your training as a space station construction workers, since uh, the best place to do that is out where the space station would be, outside in the, in the cargo bay or, or very near it. Um, what do you think it's going to mean to you and, and to the overall program? Uh, does does uh, the failure of the, uh, the hatch to open slow down space station construction even by a little bit? I certainly think there was interest in conducting these two EVAs. There was a lot of time and effort put into building the hardware and, and orchestrating the test plan so that we could test all this hardware and our, our concepts for station construction. And so certainly it is a bit of a setback. However, um, there are setbacks in a program as ambitious as NASA's space program, and NASA will figure out a way to get the information they need to successfully construct the station. This hardware may fly on a later flight, or they may use some more extensive ground testing 
to get the information they feel they'll need, but uh, they will certainly take the steps to ensure that uh, we have enough knowledge to have a successful station construction and maintenance program. Sure. Well, the two of you... Uh, John, let me just add that we sure. spent the last 10 months uh, training extensively for these two spacewalks, and a lot of the work that we did underwater in Houston and on board the uh, weightless training aircraft down there as well was spent validating the approaches and the, the techniques that we would use here in orbit and to a large, large extent, we have a lot of confidence in those techniques because we work so hard on them on the ground. So I think the final icing on the cake and the final confirmation here in orbit would have been uh, really valuable to us. But certainly we've learned a great deal in the last nine or ten months just in the developmental and practice work we've done in training for the spacewalks. Yeah, the two of you are making the best of this, of course, and we've been watching you test some of the space station tools you're going to be using when you build the station later on. How do the tools work uh, in the tests that you've conducted on them over the past couple of hours? Well, the ISS Tower tool is, has perform, performed well and as expected uh, during the tests we did on the mid-deck. And we were able at least to fulfill uh, some of the objectives for the flight by doing the power tool checkout and then sending that data down to the ground. All right, Tammy. I, I, I've, I've, I've talked to Tammy Jernigan and Tom Jones uh, several times over the past couple of years, and, you know, maybe it's my question. Maybe my questions are bummer questions for you guys, but the two of you, despite the fact that you're always optimistic and almost bubbly, seem, uh, seem pretty much subdued as we talk right now. Am, am I right about this, or is it my questions leading you down a, a very serious and somber path today? No, I think certainly... Uh that we are feeling uh, some combination of uh, disappointment at the failure of the hatch, um, but yet um, pleasure in being part of this mission that's been in every other way very successful. And um, we're both technical people, and so when you ask us a technical question, you, you get a technical answer. I'm glad to see some smiles from both of you. Tom, uh, any final comments? We've only got about a minute left. Well, Disappointment naturally comes into our feelings, uh, and I hope for better times on future missions where I'm assigned to a spacewalk. I'll be an optimist about that, too. But you can't take away the fabulous nature of this experience. And personally, last night, even after our, uh, our EVAs were canceled, I spent an entire night orbit of the Earth looking down at thunderstorms and out at the southern constellations and watching the lightning flicker off the surfaces of the orbiter. And that's such an experience that uh, is... Uh, unreachable on the ground, but I'm very privileged to be here, and I have no basis for complaints.